Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Duez. I am the Visitor Services Intern at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, sponsored by the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. We are a 501c3 nonprofit established in 1997 to support Ohio's only National Wildlife Refuge complex with youth development, public use projects, and most recently, land acquisition and restoration. We are located along the southern shore of Lake Erie near Oak Harbor in some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. If you are interested in learning more about us and what we do, I will add a link into the chat right now. This link will point you in the right direction to become a member, make a tax deductible donation to support our work, or even to shop our online nature store. Today, I am joined by Rick Gardner, Rick Gardner is currently the Chief Botanist for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. Rick has been studying Ohio's flora and natural areas for 27 years. He has spent most of his career in the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves, but has worked for the Division of Wildlife and the Ohio Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Rick has conducted vegetation inventory studies at Cedar Point National Wildlife Refuge and other sites on Lake Erie. He is also a visiting scholar at the Ohio State University Herbarium, conducting research on Ohio's flora, including invasive plant species, the sedge family, running buffalo clover, and xeric limestone prairies. Rick has published peer-reviewed peer articles on these subjects, and he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in botany from Miami University. He has so graciously joined us today to share his program on flora of Ohio's Lake Erie coastal marshes. Before we begin, I will just ask that you stay muted to minimize background noise for our presenter. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat as we go, and we'll have time at the end of the program to do a Q&A. So now I will turn it over to Rick to get started. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Uh, I see some familiar names in the, in the audience, so thank you for joining uh, very much. Uh, um, just a little bit more about myself. I, I'm born and raised in, in Ohio. I grew up in Hamilton, Ohio, near Cincinnati, and uh, always had an interest in nature and, and uh, from a very young age and uh, developed a real love for plants and uh, always had a strong passion for, for nature. And, and I've been very fortunate to, live, to work and uh, and, and live uh, the life uh, in the conservation and botany field and uh, working for some great organizations and agencies like the Department of Natural Resources and, and the, uh, the Nature Conservancy. And uh, over the years, I, I've visited about every square corner of the state. And, uh, and what I'm gonna talk about today is the uh, flora of Lake Erie marshes. And I'll get to sharing my screen. And and wait, hold on. You know, <laughs> sorry, I had a little technical difficulties there. Um, Sorry about that. Um, talking about four of Ohio's Lake Erie coastal marshes, and uh, kind of, our, uh, of course, I grew up in southern Ohio, so I, I really we never really traveled much up to Lake Erie, and uh, through work is really my when I got to really get to know the, the coastal marshes and uh, and, and Lake Erie, 
and uh, certainly is an incredible area of biodiversity and importance uh, resource for many reasons, uh, biological and economic. And I'm going to talk about the flora, of course. Uh, it's, it's my specialty. So uh, just kind of run through some of the topics I'll, I'll cover in this presentation. Uh, I'll kind of go through I very much into history, especially early Ohio history. So I, I think it's important to kind of go back in time to see what, what it was like and then what we are today. So I'll quick go through that real, real fast. And then uh, kind of overview of its coastal marshes and wet meadows, different types that we have in Ohio. And uh, within each group, I'm going to talk about some of the rarest of the rare uh, plants, some of those that uh, we almost uh, the last stronghold or last site in the state uh, for the species is in the coastal marshes. And then also talk about some of the worst, the worst invasive plants, which I'd rather not talk about. But uh, there's certainly ne much needed uh, topic. So I'm going to highlight some of those. <clears throat> and then uh, going to specific sites. Uh, some of the sites I, I've, I've surveyed uh, in very in uh, detailed and others I, I, over the years have visited a number of times and share some of those uh, re, uh, survey results. And then uh, kind of, I'll be talking about the importance of coastal marshes throughout the talk, but I kind of recap uh, their importance and then what's being done to conserve these uh, viable uh, resources. Oh, sorry, uh, the physiographic regions of Ohio, if you're not familiar with the term physiographic region, they're, they're uh, regions that have similar topography and, and geological history. And Ohio has five major uh, physiographic regions, and we're going to be talking about the Lake Plain physiographic region. And it's the uh, what Lake Erie and the coastline, and then what formerly was uh, just after uh, glaciation, uh, the Lake Plain there, which uh, the Great Black Swamp, the, the largest wetland system Ohio had, uh, was a part of. And uh, the importance, uh, the Great Black Swamp would be a whole new, different subject to talk about. And uh, it would be in very interesting uh, story about that in another time. Um, but Here's the map of Ohio today. Uh, we've, we've done a lot to change, uh, alter the landscape in Ohio. Ohio, it's hard to believe that Ohio at one time was considered the frontier, the unknown frontier. Uh, and, uh, and it's just the wildness of the state. Uh, Ohio was blessed with a, a very wild state in the sense of abundant wildlife as a sacred hunting ground for a number of uh, Native American tribes. Um, it was uninhabited for a brief period. Um, and then uh, as Europeans moved west um, and south, uh, the different tribes that were displaced uh, moved into Ohio and eventually moved further west. <clears throat> And through all that change, uh, studies uh, looking at the loss of wetlands, uh, the estimated amount of acres uh, over uh, about 150 years, uh, close to 1 million acres of coastal wetlands have been lost. About 10% remain in Ohio today. And Ohio has uh, seen the, one of the worst, uh, most dramatic loss of wetlands uh, for a state in the state in the, in the nation. Um, one of the uh, really fascinating things that I've, I've done a number of times for studies is going back to original land survey and reading uh, what the surveyors noted in their field notes when they're going laying out the sections, the quarter sections. Uh, in townships and ranges, and uh, it noted the vegetation, some more detailed than others. But uh, you can find, digging, mining through all that information, you can find some real gold nuggets in there. And uh, this is a, 
1820 survey map. Uh, this was in Richard Loudon's uh, paper. He did a flora of, of Winans Point Conservation Club, and, and he published the paper in 1969. So I took out his uh, this figure he had in his paper, which is the original land survey. And uh, the little dots on the map are, represent uh, marshland. And uh, Loudon uh, had the arrow in the, in the map to point out uh, what was called Squaw Island, which was about a 130 acre uh, peninsula. And over the years, that island disappeared. Uh, we jump another 100 years, uh, one of the, must be one of the first aerial photos uh, surveys uh, taken was uh, Linus Point had an aerial photo of a Muddy Creek Bay and Sandusky Bay in 1926. And uh, where, where uh, Squaw Island was uh, disappeared. And what was one of the causes for this uh, changing of, of the marshlands was, was draining the wetlands and the Great Black Swamp to the west and, and other watersheds. Influence of more water flowing into the, to, to the basin and uh, impacting the, the uh, coastal marshes. Uh, so, so we started losing some wetlands that way and also uh, just development along the edges. And look at a map here of today of the same valley or the same bay, excuse me. Uh, you can see much more reduced wetlands. And if you overlaid that map, you can kind of see the, the change, pretty much dramatic change. And it's degradation of, of the marshes themselves through, through erosion and also uh, lake level changes. And, uh, and then also degradation of the quality of the wetlands from uh, nutrient runoff. And uh, we diked the wetlands to help protect them from erosion and also to help control the water levels within those wetlands. And all the, almost all the uh, coastal marshes uh, that had direct connection to the, to the lake uh, were, were disappeared. Now this is a 1900 topo map uh, showing the marshes. Uh, and uh, I have Ottawa National Air Refuge marked up there. And just the, the amount of acres of marsh land that was there a, a century later after Ohio uh, became a state, basically. Um, still pretty extensive. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of that's been uh, drained and, and, and modified in some way. And uh, the Ohio the Office of Coastal Management produced a, a report and had a, this map uh, showing the, the current uh, marshlands along uh, Lake Erie coast. And uh, throughout the Lake Erie Basin uh, in, the south, in the western portion. Now moving forward to uh, plant communities. Um, plant communities are a way that we, we kind of classify what we're seeing, showing, describe what we're seeing on the ground. And uh, when you describe a, a plant community or association, you use a dominant species as part of the name. So uh, uh, thanks to uh, Ohio State University having the research stations up on the lake, the first one at Cedar Point, and then the one at Gibraltar Island. And uh, we have a, a lot of information about what Ohio was like, uh, the coastal marshes were like uh, around the, the turn of the 20th century. We also have uh, famous work by uh, Edwin Leakham Mosley's uh, Sandusky uh, Flora and also uh, Peter's uh, Flora Western Lake Erie with reference of what was, what was there at the time around the 20, early 20th century. <clears throat> and I basically used what uh, Otto Jennings uh, in his paper that he published in 1908 of the Cedar Point uh, plant communities that were there. Um, another very interesting 
topic would be to talk about Cedar Point and how much has changed there. But uh, these are the different communities. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the possibly one that you could say is historical. And that's the wild rice marsh. Uh, wild rice, we have uh, two species of wild rice in Ohio. Uh, they reach their, their southern limit in Ohio. And uh, both species, northern and southern wild rice, occurred up on the lake. Uh, don't know exactly how abundant each one was compared to the other one. Uh, but southern wild rice is probably the, the more common one on the lake. And uh, this is if you had wild rice, uh, I, like myself, it, it's a little different than the rice you buy in the stores, uh, but uh, still have large rice colon, uh, marshes up in Minnesota in the great upper Great Lakes. So, uh, so it's not unlike Ohio, which uh, they still have theirs. Uh, we pretty much have, have lost ours. And thanks to all that uh, early uh, survey work, we do know that how much wild rice to some extent was along the Lake Erie shore in the marshes and uh, along Cedar Point, East Harbor, Porridge River, uh, Sandusky Bay, they all occurred in all those places. And now, uh, at least in recent history, we haven't found any uh, colonies of wild rice. And wild rice uh, uh, can fluctuate year to year in abundance of, of the plants. If you ever been had the fortune to see wild rice. It's it's really a tall grass, very showy grass. It's one that you would not miss when it's in full full fruit. And uh, wild uh, northern wild rice has always been kind of considered a, a variety, but has recently elevated to a species. So we're still trying to figure out exactly its whole range in Ohio. It's always been kind of lumped under southern wild rice. And how you tell the two apart is real quick way is just the uh, leaf width. Uh, Southern wild rice, which I have a specimen here, is uh, about just over two centimeters in width. And northern wild rice is half that size uh, width, uh, about, a, about a centimeter. So it's a, that's a quick way of doing it. There's also differences in the fruit, uh, the florets and stuff like that. But uh, that's the that's the easiest first character to look for. <clears throat> now, the more one of the more dominant uh, plant communities is burr reed, uh, cattail marsh, and fragmentes and, and parentheses. Uh, the non-native fragmentes started invading our, our coastal marshes uh, very early on. Uh, uh, it was noted in in the in the plant in the studies. Uh, as being one of the major components of this plant community. Um, and it, of course, now it's our, one of our major problems along the coast. Uh, common burr reed, we have several species of burr reed, but the common burr reed, uh, Sporganium uricarpum, is the most common one, especially on the lake. And then the broadleaf cattail, which was our native cart, cat, uh, cattail and the one that was present uh, 200 years ago, and uh, unfortunately, that species has been slowly disappearing over the years uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, the main reason is the narrow leaf cattail, uh, Typha angustifolia, which was present in North America very early on in the 17th century, and there's been some debate about if it even was possibly native to the Atlantic coastline of North America, uh, US and, and Canada. And uh, it has very narrow leaves, uh, very long. Uh, uh, the male and female flowers are, se are separated, uh, well separated on, on a broadleaf cattail. Uh, they're close together or on top of each other. There's no se uh, separation between the two. <clears throat> and uh, it's very aggressive plant, uh, very takes over wetlands very quickly. It's, it has a variety, it can handle a lot of different water levels. So it, it can evade a lot of different types of wetlands, which uh, very frustrating for the agencies like uh, Division of Natural Areas and Preserves, which we have a variety of, of wetland types, including fens, which the species invades. And uh, the other 
uh, cause for decline of broadleaf cattail is that it hybridizes uh, with the broadleaf cattail and forms a hybrid, the hybrid cattail. And that one is, uh, is very aggressive as well and actually can outcompete its parents. And uh, a lot of the reports for broadleaf cattail is, uh, is probably hybrid cattail and they back cross with each other, which they get more and more muddy about what, what you're looking at out in the field. And uh, I have a harder and harder time finding the broadleaf cattail in Ohio. It's not as common as it used to be, that's for sure. Now, one of the rarities of, of this plant community type is deer's tongue arrowhead. We have a number of species of arrowhead in Ohio. Uh, deer tongue arrowhead, uh, according to the uh, Sandusky flora by Link, uh, Mosley and Peters Western Basin uh, flora back in the early uh, early 20th century. Uh, this plant was, was not very rare and actually is as common as the common arrowhead, but it has disappeared over the years. Um, and now it's, it's potentially threatened Ohio, which is uh, the lowest level. There's endangered, threatened, and then potentially threatened. Uh, that classification is used to describe a species that we're, it's on the cusp or in the next 30 years, it could become threatened or even sooner. And it's very localized in populations. So uh, this one uh, has a range that goes further south, but, but the, mostly along the coast of Lake Erie is where its stronghold is. And uh, it looks very much quite different from the common arrowhead. It has uh, ovate leaves. Uh, it can sometimes have little teeth at the base of the leaf, um, but most of the times it's totally smooth. It doesn't have any type of a, a little points at the base and uh, can form decent sized colonies. Uh, and it's one of the easier ones to identify of the rare, rare arrowheads. The other species that the uh, Loudon and, and others, uh, not Loudon, but the uh, uh, Mosley and Peters noted as, as not being very common was pickerel weed. This is not a state listed plant, but I, Find it kind of interesting that it's uh, it's one that has increased uh, in the last 100 years, according to their those studies. Um, to today, it's something you find in in our dike wetlands along the coast pretty regularly, and it's very important uh, uh, pollinator uh, pollen source for pollen for uh, bumblebees and other pollinators. And uh, one of the more easy to identify <laughs> uh, marshes is, is American Lotus Marsh. Uh, you can drive on State Route 2, see, driving across Sandusky Bay and identify it from the far away. Uh, it can handle pretty deep water, uh, grow a meter in length or more. And uh, if it's under in deep water conditions, the leaves float on the water surface. Uh, when the water level is lower, they're, they're out of the water. And uh, the flowers are out, very showy plant. Uh, it can be very aggressive. Um, it, uh, so in the southern part of the state where people introduced it, uh, they find out very quickly that maybe that was a mistake, uh, trying to put their boat in to go fishing or stuff. But one of the things I, I'm most interesting about the plant is, is that it has a, the, the way it disperses its seeds with the, its a receptacle with the seeds in it. And of course, um, Native American tribes, it was a very important food source for them. Uh, the Erie Indians that lived on Lake Erie, and, uh, uh, one of their primary food sources. So uh, and it, and it's still uh, uh, consumed. Uh, in the Great Lakes region and other parts as a food source. <clears throat> and all these plant communities kind of grade into each other. And uh, the next one kind of has American lotus in it, but it also shares uh, dominance with spatter dock and water lily. And this is a photograph from Jennings uh, plant community study of Cedar Point. And you kind of see the uh, cattail marsh in the background and then in the front ground 
the lily pads and stuff. That's the uh, this plant community. Um, uh, spatter dock, which is very common uh, emergent or uh, floating lead plant. Uh, it's one of the common ones. But there is one, uh, there, we have two species of new far, it's a genus. Um, it's a lot, a lot less uh, state in danger. That's uh, bullhead lily, uh, new far variegata. And uh, it takes, takes uh, it's easy to pass by this plant. Uh, and since, uh, since you see the common one so much, but uh, the leaves are a little bit different shape. Uh, it's a lot, a little bit bigger plant. And it's a species that's uh, common up north, but uh, it uh, only occurs at uh, in one site in in the Lake Erie coastal marshes, and that's at McGee Marsh, in one of the deep ditches there. Um, when you're going out to the drive out to go to the boardwalk in a visitor center, <clears throat> and uh, as you can see, it has a little bit more of a deeper sinus than the common new far. And in the flowers, the, there's a little bit of a red tinge in the, inside of the, the flowers and compared to the, the, the common new uh, spatter dock. So, so that's one. Uh, we only know of the Portage Lakes region is the only other place that you can find uh, uh, bullhead lily in Ohio right now that we know of. And uh, that could be as limited as range. It's uh, in Ohio. Now, one of the worst, the worst invasives is uh, European frog bit. Um, this was introduced in North American uh, Arboretum in, in, in Ottawa, Canada in 1932, and has been spreading in the Great Lakes region and other parts of North America. And uh, this is one of the species I wish I had never found, uh, new to the state of Ohio. Uh, I, I found it in 2003 uh, in Western Lake Erie Basin and uh, first documented occurrence of it. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to, to keep it under control. And, and uh, unfortunately it has been spreading uh, along the coastline and marshes. Uh, and I'll mention it a couple more times uh, later on. But uh, it's a plant that <clears throat> floats on the water, looks like a miniature uh, water lily, uh, has similar kind of shaped leaves, but just a much smaller plant. Uh, as you can see, it can form very dense colonies. Uh, one of the minor weaknesses is that it is dioecious, which means two houses. It has male and female flowers, but uh, primarily spreads by vegetatively. So it, it sends out rhizomes, it spreads really fast. And uh, it has turions, winter buds, and uh, parts of it get carried by uh, boats and stuff and into new waterways. Um, just an example of how, how much it relies on vegetative control or spread is that at Maumee Bay State Park, uh, the main marsh there doesn't have uh, European frog, but at least the last time I was there. But uh, there's a very small diked, uh, maybe a couple acres at most, dike wetland within that larger wetland. And within that, it looks exactly like the, the lower picture there, solid mass of, of European frog bit. And because of its dense vegetation, it, it shades out uh, the aquatic plants below. And uh, when it degrade, uh, starts to break down, it depletes the oxygen levels. And overall, it just, because of those factors and other factors that biodiversity drops once it goes in there. And there's really no easy control for it. Uh, there's been really mechanical control is just harvesting it or, or if you catch it real early on, hand pull it best you can. But uh, it's really a hard one to control in, in the best way is just try to keep things, ever keep it from ever getting into your, your water body or your marsh. And this is a, a map that USGS just just published uh, earlier well, last last Saturday um, that shows the watersheds that's it's currently in, and you can see uh, western and central Ohio 
uh, Sandusky uh, and adjacent watersheds it being in, but uh, it's not in that entire area, it's just along the coast that we know of. So, you know, good chance we'll find it in other water reservoirs and lakes to the south one of these days. Now more a submerged marsh uh, community is the pond wheat eelgrass uh, community type. Uh, this is mostly uh, plants that are underwater and maybe has some leaves at the floating on top. And uh, eelgrass uh, is co-dominant. Uh, we have over 20 species of pond weeds. Uh, they get kind of get a bad rap in some cases because uh, they get tangled up in your if you have a motor on your boat and stuff like that, but uh, very important food source for a lot of wildlife, waterfowl. <clears throat> and eelgrass, uh, we used to track eelgrass as a, as a as we thought it was rare enough that we need to keep track of it, but uh, we found it to be still pretty abundant. Uh, it just gets its name uh, tape grass because of the very long linear leaves and uh, looks like tape and uh, form lar large colonies. Uh, like European frogbit relies more on vegetation spread than in uh, sexual uh, reproduction. But it does have a very fun and curious way of, of re sexual reproduction is that uh, it sends up a flower. Uh, there's male and female flowers like, like European frogbit. Yeah, it's dioecious. And uh, the male flowers uh, release their pollen, which floats on the water. And then if there is a female plant nearby, uh, the pollen attaches to the stigma of the flower and pollinates that flower. So it's kind of kind of ingenious way of, of pollination in a, in a water environment. And one of the long uh, invasives that the uh, and kind of like the cattail, it's kind of overtaking our native submergent marsh plants is uh, European or Eurasian, excuse me, uh, water milfoil. And this was introduced uh, roughly in the early 1900s and has been spread uh, over the years and is not very difficult to ever find it in any natural lake or reservoir or any of the marshes up on the Lake Erie and uh, has a lot of negative impacts on, on our wildlife. And it's replacing our native uh, aquatics, especially Myriophum sibiricum, our native water milfoil. And uh, this is a specimen of uh, water milfoil from Sandusky Bay collected by uh, Mosley from the Sandusky Flora research. And uh, the number of segments uh, of the leaves is how you differentiate it, one of the characters, one of the quick ones, and you count the numbers. And the segments of uh, the native milfoil is usually between five to nine, and maybe up in the lower teens, but no more than that. And the non-native is uh, 14 or more uh, segments. There are also flower character differences, but, uh, but that's the, the main one. And uh, very often, uh, Sibiricum, the American water milfoil, it's now endangered in Ohio. And uh, some of the places that we know uh, up on the lake, uh, we haven't been able to find uh, this plant. Uh, the European, Eurasian one has, is the one you find. So it's a sad, and it, like the European frog, but it's very difficult to, uh, to, to get it out of the water body when it's there. Then the last plant community I'm going to talk about is the Canada Blue Joint Wet Meadow. Uh, when you talk about meadows, it's, it's uh, dominated by sedges, but there is a one, one grass that's pretty dominant. That's the Canada Blue Joint. So it's Canada Blue Joint and, and a number of species of, of sedges that uh, make up this plant community. And this one's a little bit further off the coast, uh, back behind the marshes, uh, a little bit more uh, shallower water, uh, water pretty much drains by, uh, by midsummer. And uh, these wet meadows uh, have a number of, of, uh, of wildflowers, uh, some very rare, 
um, one, uh, unfortunately, uh, gets uh, has been treated uh, we didn't know about uh, American reed grass or uh, Phragmites americanus. Uh, this one uh, was originally described as a variety of uh, Phragmites australis, then the non-native one. And then it was uplift, upgraded to or elevated to subspecies and now uh, elevated to a full species. And uh, it's potentially threatened in Ohio. And uh, the last stronghold for this native uh, species is a uh, Phragmites is up on the lake. Uh, it's very similar to the Eurasian. Uh, when you see them side by side, uh, you can see the difference. You're like, okay, I can see that. Uh, the leaves are green, not the bluish green, like the non-native Phragmites. Uh, not as aggressive as, as the non-native. Uh, it's just kind of scattered stems amongst the other vegetation when you find it. Like in the picture on the left, uh, is a light, it turns a light green to then a yellow in the fall, late su uh, summer, early fall. It has deciduous sheaths. Uh, they break away from the stem, unlike the, the non-native. And then the, the one character that you kind of can see from a distance and, and kind of as a red flag is, is the maroon uh, band that's right at the node on the stem. And, uh, and this species, uh, unfortunately, because, uh, I mean, we've been trying to get rid of Phragmites out of our marshes. And unfortunately, uh, we have some documented occurrence of, occurrences of, of this plant being sprayed accidentally. Uh, uh, and, and those colonies being killed. So we, we, uh, we have lost some due to uh, just mis-ID. And uh, so it's good to know this plant so it doesn't disappear. And uh, besides the, uh, the maroon stem, there's also the character of the plume, the, the panicle at the top. The panicle is a lot less dense and showy as the non-native one, as you can see here. Uh, Unfortunately, the one picture on the left is a little hard, but usually they're a lot less, uh, the panicles, a lot less flowered than the uh, non-native one. So the plume is, looks like a, like a weak, weak one, uh, this plant than the non-native one. So, so that, that red band, which becomes more obvious uh, in the late summer, early fall, it, is kind of the, the red flag of the character is like, oh, that, that's the, the NATO. And they, the two uh, species rarely hybridize. Uh, there's a couple of instances, instances that we, we think we found a colony that was uh, maybe a hybrid between the two because the, the maroon color was not as deep and, and it has characters, a little bit more characters of the non-native in it. And this is distribution of the native uh, Phragmites. And you can see uh, up on uh, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge uh, is, is one hot spot. And then another hot spot is uh, Rest Haven Wildlife Area in Erie County. And it's been found as far south as Cedar Bog State Nature Reserve uh, in uh, Clark, uh, Champaign County, excuse me. And then a uh, much more showy plant and one that uh, gets people excited is, is Eastern Prairie Fringe Orchid. It's a federal and state threatened uh, species. Uh, again, the uh, coastal uh, wetlands are its, its last stronghold. Uh, we do have a couple other places south of the lake, Lake Plain, uh, where it grows. But uh, this is a plant that was documented in, in my, where I live in central Ohio as being not terribly uncommon. And uh, now, as you can it's now fairly threatened, uh, current wet prairies in, in central Ohio and other parts of the state. And it blooms in late June, early July. It's pollinated uh, at night by sphinx moss. Uh, so if it's a large enough population of this plant um, at, at dusk, um, if you're out there, you can start to, you can smell the, the very sweet fragrance that the, the sphinx moss uh, trigger them to come to the plant and pollinate it. And one of the plants that's kind of impacting uh, Eastern Prairie Fringe Orchid uh, is a non, another non-native uh, 
plant uh, reed canary grass. It's kind of like similar story as Phragmites. There's a native genotype, uh, North American genotype, and then the Eurasian genotype. The Eurasian genotype has overtaken the native one. I've never seen the native one in Ohio. Uh, the the non-native has bluish green leaves like the like the non-native Phragmites. Forms big colonies, and once it's there, it's hard to get rid of. And uh, a lot of the uh, wet meadows where each prairie fringe orchid uh, occurs, uh, this plant has moved in. And it's we use different methods, but the one that seems to be the most effective, if it's a possibility, is to do a prescribed burn, and then when it starts to send up its new shoots, uh, spray it with a uh, wetland-based, uh, wetland-approved uh, herbicide. Then some uh, going into some of the specific sites uh, in 2003, uh, 2002, excuse me, I, I did a survey of Cedar Point National Wildlife Refuge. I uh, spent that uh, over a dozen times I visited the site. I spent a good 12 hour days up there uh, documenting the flora. And uh, if you want to see uh, ferns and conifers, uh, the coast is not where to go. Uh, very few ferns. It's a pteridophytes or ferns. Um, the, fern, the old fern allies, lycophytes, there's none. <laughs> and then conifers, are, there are none. And then the, the flowering plants are the dominance. Uh, uh, sedges and grasses are some of the, the bigger families there, um, as are the, the aster family. And uh, got over 380 species there, and, and about three quarters of the species documented were, were native. And uh, wild rice, the southern wild rice, the largest population uh, in Ohio is, is at Cedar Point National Art Refuge. Uh, that population varies in size from year to year. Uh, the year I was there, it was, it was hundreds and hundreds of plants. And uh, wheat sedge, uh, uh, potentially threatened species, it was, it was several populations of that there as, as well. And the plant that, that kind of got me interested in doing a flora up there was uh, Jim McCormick, who many of you know, uh, he was a botanist with us before he went to wildlife. And uh, he found American bull rush, the true American bull rush up there uh, uh, at the point of uh, Little Cedar Point. Um, and uh, differs from the common American three square uh, by having wider stems and, and wing stems. And the only site that we still know that we have in Ohio is from Cedar Point. And uh, it's still there as much as I understand. And the last time I was there, it was still, still, still hanging on. Now, uh, going back to the original map here, and we're gonna start talking about the heart of the Ottawa and Navarre unit is where I did a survey and their flora. And Ottawa National Re Refuge, which all of you know very well, um, <clears throat> has very similar flora as the, some of the sites I've already talked about. Uh, one of the, the rarer species that, that it has in it is the uh, state endangered Wapato, uh, Sagittaria cuneata. Looks similar to our common arrowhead, but the, the uh, base of the leaves, uh, much more narrow sinus and uh, has like eelgrass, uh, basal uh, aquatic leaves and uh, only known from a few places like on the lake. It's uh, that's as far south as it gets over at the, the southern limit of its range. And then at the Navarre unit, uh, I got uh, kind of same amount, uh, a lot smaller than Cedar Point. Cedar Point's over 2,000 acres. Uh, Navarre's about a quarter of that size and we and uh, Tom Arbor who was a botanist who worked for us at the time and, and myself documented about 280 over 280 species and an exact same percentage of native species 74 percent and then uh, this is a map that coastal made uh, showing the coastal mar marshes again and uh, the arrow is pointing to the next two sites uh, Sheldon Marsh and Oldman Creek uh, Sheldon Marsh is one of the last uh, undeveloped marshes uh, on the south side of Lake Erie. And uh, Sheldon purchased it, and people thought it was crazy because it's undeveloped marsh. And uh, our division acquired it 
and uh, 472 acres in size and uh, about 300 species of birds have been documented there. It's a great place to go birding as, as Ottawa and other sites. Uh, Old Woman Creek State Nature Preserve is uh, an estuary, a uh, freshwater estuary. It's also, a, besides being a state nature preserve, a nat, one of, I think over 40 national estuar estuarian, uh, estuarine, excuse me, research reserves. And it's 571 acres in size. Uh, it has a trail system. You can kayak and canoe there. And uh, it has a barrier beach that during uh, uh, low lake level years, um, it, it closes in. And then when the lake levels are up, uh, it opens back up to the lake. And uh, the, the creek water and the lake water intermix and kind of form a new different type of water chemistry. And a lot of studies go on there at, at Olden Creek. Going east uh, past Cleveland is Mirror Marsh State Nature Preserve. Uh, this is a project that Cleveland Museum of Natural History and our Division of Natural Areas and Preserves have, have been working on. Cleveland Museum has been doing most of the work up there and, and uh, uh, probably over 800 acres now. I kind of, I know Cleveland Museum has been buying more and more land there. And the uh, Cleveland Museum has taken on a major restoration project, which uh, if any, if anyone from Cleveland Museum is on this or sees this talk, they'll probably cringe. I am showing a picture of the old way it used to be with pretty much solid Phragmites. But now they've been doing a lot of aerial spraying and seeding and letting the seed bake that's there come back. And it's quite the amazing restoration effort. Uh, Northern wild rice has popped up there. Uh, we're still debating if it's came in on, from uh, the seed mix that was planted in the at the marsh, but uh, it wasn't post, supposed to be in the marsh. It was in there as a, a contaminated with it. Um, so we're trying to figure it out. If it is a natural population, that'd be fantastic because there's hundreds and hundreds of, of that wild rice, northern wild rice there at the restored uh, mineral marsh. And then the last uh, site I'm going to point out is Arcola Creek. Uh, the another freshwater estuary, uh, Lake Metro Parks, and the Na Nature Service of uh, Ohio uh, preserved this site. And American Sweet Flag, one of the state listed plants there. Unlike the non native, Sweet Flag has a, is a, it's fertile. So it has a, when the spadix, which is the, uh, what the arrow is pointing to, is, is very plump. The seeds are all uh, viable seeds, not aborted seeds, like on the non native, and has, uh, Solid green leaves, not glossy, uh, light green leaves like the non-native sweet flag. And then uh, importance of coastal marshes uh, is very important for wildlife, which I pointed out over the years uh, over the, uh, the talk, especially birds, but also for reptiles, uh, uh, amphibians, all kinds of wildlife. Uh, some of the birds, uh, I, not a big time birder, but I, I do go up on the lake from time to time. Usually go with somebody who knows birds better than I do and point them all out to me, especially the shoreline birds. And then uh, as, as Jessica said, the uh, very important biological uh, is globally important uh, bird area for that reason, for so many different species of shoreline birds and waterfowl use it as nesting and, and food for, for migration period and all that. So it's very important for that. Of course, I talked about some of the rare plants and then let's come up because of algal, bloom, algal blooms is the, the importance for taking out nutrients and filtering out sediment. So uh, uh, Governor DeWine, uh, one of his first initiatives was doing H2 Ohio and setting aside areas and uh, Quickly go into that since I'm running out of time. Uh, H2 Ohio, uh, different departments are involved with this. Agriculture is working with farmers. Uh, our department's working on the wetland restoration portion of it, of Ohio EPA. And, uh, and we have a number of projects. This is a map uh, we have, this is the first phase. And one of the uh, projects kind of slow, taking out nutrients 
and creating and restoring wetlands in the watershed, but also on the coast, reconnecting coastal marshes to the lake, such as the Navarre Marsh that I talked about. And then uh, I want to put in a point and a little teaser for our upcoming uh, wetland plants guide. Uh, we're going to have a guidebook coming out um, this summer. Uh, and uh, it's kind of geared towards landowners uh, and, and anybody who's interested in wetlands, but also anyone who's uh, agencies or anything that's thinking of restoring wetlands and what plants they might want to include in their wetland mix in their restoration efforts. And it's, it's going to be a guide. We're partnering with Division of Wildlife who do those high, really fantastic field guides. Or it's going to be a field field guide like their other field guides and booklet form that we can easily carry around. And we'll give some pointers on identification in the field and some, some little tidbits about the species. And I want to thank a number of people uh, who are a lot better photographers than myself. I, I use, they graciously donated, uh, let me have permission to, to share their photos. And I also want to thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for granting me permission to, to survey their, their properties over the years and, and monitoring uh, Eastern Prairie Fringe Orchid with them. Uh, this is a picture of Ron Huffman, the biologist there, and Sarah, when, who doesn't work there anymore, but they, they found the uh, Eastern Prairie Fringe Orchid in uh, 2007 for the first time at Ottawa National Wild Refuge. And also want to thank the friends of Ottawa National Wild Refuge for uh, having me speak, be part of their speakers. And uh, that is all. Thank you so much. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Thank you. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat right now, or you can unmute yourself and ask him that way. Um, I do want to ask when it is available, how do you get that wetland plant? Oh, yes. Down? Yes. Sorry, I forgot that. Um, well, you can contact uh, our division or Division of Wildlife. Uh, our, uh, you can find the information on our website. We'll have a, a PDF version uh, of it uh, on our website. Uh, uh, Division of Wildlife has all their field guides in PDF form on the website. So you just contact either our division or Division of Wildlife, and you can order some. And it'll be, or I, I'll bring some up the next time I come up. Whenever you got them, so. <laughs> but yeah, we hope they get. It'd be I'm hoping it'd be a very popular field guide, and and I think people will really enjoy it. Yeah, it looks awesome. I use some of the photos from it in my talk, so. <laughs> um, I did put in the chat uh, a link for our programs that will be coming up in the future, and also a link for our survey. Uh, if you take it, you will have access to a special coupon code for the Rookery Nature Store. Um, so we'd really appreciate it if you take the survey. Um, and I'm not really seeing any questions in the okay. chat. So if anybody does have any questions, please put them in right now or unmute yourself. Otherwise, uh, we could probably end soon. I'll give somebody a couple I had a seconds. Question. Okay. Yeah, I had a great. question for you, Rick. Hi, that was yeah. a good Josh. Thanks for presenting. I learned a lot. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm a um, biologist with Fish and Wildlife as well. I work mm -hmm. in a story monitoring program. Okay. Um, we just found a, a, a rare species of Persicaria in Southern Ohio, one of our refuges. Mm -hmm. Persicaria cetacea, I think. No, it's cetacea, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I, I saw that it was listed as endangered in Ohio. Yes. Is there any possibility that species could be in um, on Ottawa refuge or, or in North uh well we yeah it's it's possible uh we don't have any records of it occurring there it's most of the record all the records we have in ohio are over in northeast ohio um kind of part of the uh wetlands uh, marshlands around uh the akron uh, canton area of that and uh a little further north too but uh but that's that's the heart that's where it occurs and i don't have any knowledge of any populations in the western lake western lake erie basin part of ohio but can't rule it out certainly can't right. rule it out okay thank you. Mm -hmm. anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask before I we think, end i think derek had a question okay 
<laughs> oh, I was just going to ask if uh, I'm doing some work, or I have been doing some work over the last couple of years uh, mm-hmm. at the Great Egret Marsh Preserve. Oh, yes. The Nature Preservancy mm-hmm. We've been doing some return removal in the natural embayment part. Yeah. And I was just curious if you had a good list of sedges you could send me that I could keep an eye out for for what should be there. Because there is a bunch of sedges I just haven't had a chance to see them all out yet. Yeah, yeah, Derek. Uh, I think I have a, a, a plant list from when I visited it when uh, Nature Conservancy was looking into purchasing it. I, I went out there with uh, Terry Seidel with uh, TNC and, and I jotted down a plant list for him. So I, 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 I can provide that for you. <laughs> that, that was only a one time visit. So I, I and it was a uh, little past the prime sedge season, but uh, I, I do have a list I could provide you. Oh, you're muted now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All okay. right. Well, Terry Bremer no- here. I've got a quick question. Yeah, yeah Terry. Uh, is there a prescribed method or a, have you got a suggested idea about how you are going to connect Navarre to the lake? Well, it's, I, that's something I, I don't have the details on. Um, I can certainly, if you want to share uh, in the chat your e- email address, I can get, give you a, a contact person with DNR and, or maybe a, Rebecca or, or since it's National Wildlife Refuge, uh, uh, they're one of the, uh, they're working on a project with Ducks Unlimited. They, they can provide you the details of that. I, I don't know. I know it's taking a part of the, the berm out and, and putting some structures in there to allow water to transfer in and out control structures, much as I understand. Yeah. Living next to it, uh, we're always interested in water levels and what's oh, okay. and what's going out. <laughs> and, but we also, I'm working with the Toledo Zoo as far as blanding turtle research in there also. So, yes. Mm-hmm. And um, that would be a concern for us too. We're just starting to get a population count there and be interested in, in what else they were planning to do as far as uh, altering the bar marsh. Mm-hmm. So thank you. I'll, yeah, I'm, I looked it down the road. I'll check with Amy or somebody down there and we'll find out what, if there's any plans at all. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know where that's at either, Terry. I don't know what, what, how far along they are. So, yeah. I honestly don't know either. I know it's happening. I know it's on the plan, but I've been so focused on other things that I haven't <laughs> seen. But when Derek mentioned sedges, I'm pretty sure Rick is responsible for relocating our uh, visitor center. Yes. I- <laughs> Yes, I am. Sorry. <laughs> that just came to mind, and I'm like, oh, we have some good ones in this spot, and I'm like, right where the visitor center was going to go. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's, uh, yes, I, I remember that. Like, uh, Yeah, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but yeah, uh, we said, uh, yeah, Ottawa, after doing that survey and stuff around there, yeah, I was like, oh, you have a lot of we said here. <laughs> yeah. We're glad you found it. <laughs> all right well uh, i think we sh- we're good um thank you everybody for coming and thank you rick for presenting today um and i hope everybody has a great weekend